We have Kamadi Porter and right. Alana Arenas. Hey, Alana. Last time I saw you, I think we were having lunch. At the, yeah. <laughs> and of course, we have me, Teron Patton, yeah. and you, Jerry Lennox. Okay, right on. Okay, I think I know you. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, you may not want to after uh, after I get through today, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that said, I, you know, Ampo came out as a kind of an idea uh, many years ago. I think it was really in response to August Wilson's The Ground on Which I Stand. In 97, you know, he talked about having a, um, a, a, a kind of similar endowments or support that is that, is that Black people who are theater makers, at least in that, in that talk, it arose out of a debate between himself and Robert Brewstein, where he argued, you know, for a, a platform equally supported infrastructurally, all of these things with writers and all of that. And I, and I thought it was an imperative. And, I, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick with this idea of imperative because uh, it also lines up with something I'm, I'm reading about now the categorical imperative of Immanuel Kant, who said some very interesting things about, you know, moral uh, philosophy and so forth. And, and I think that in this age of social justice, and Corona and all of this stuff, and everybody sort of having the, the bully pulpit now, from a kind of activist point of view, uh, it's, it's, it's a curious thing. I'm going to be writing a, a, an essay on it, on the, the dilemma, the paradox, of actors or artists uh, making political stances, which is one reason, Tehran, why I, I have always cautioned against against uh, AMPA, the Lily and Marcy, the practitioners therein, anybody associated with a museum, which is asking for public support of some sort, to lead with a political agenda. It is my belief that the agenda itself, the political statements, anything that need to would need to be said is contained within the form itself, is contained within the drama, the, the, the performance, the subject that is contained in it. That's, that's all it really needs to do because the artist is not primarily concerned with right versus wrong, but with persuasion, per, persuasion and the efficacy of his persuasion or hers, as opposed to not being persuasive. And that it is the actor's job. Actually, interesting, actor comes from the same root word in Greek as hypocrite. That is somebody presenting themselves to be something that they are actually not. And so it's, 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 it's really how does then the actor really make uh, the artist, the performer, really sort of do something, take a job, perform it, do it well, and then later apologize for it or, or believe that they have to do something that is super that is in addition to that, some sort of extracurricular thing that would redeem the arts or the content that they put out. So in other words, I guess this is a long way of saying that in its very existence, AMPA is an agenda and its agenda is to chronicle the performative experiences and contributions of the diasporic experience in North America. And so I think in so doing, you know, that the people programming AMPA, doing its collect permanent collections or what have you, exhibits, are in themselves all of the statements that it need uh, to make. And I think that the agenda for AMPA is to highlight, showcase, uh, chronicle, uh, put up for study debates or what have you, uh, the most exemplary examples of the diasporic experience. If you look at, uh, and you've heard me say it a lot, and I, I could certainly send you a bunch of the literature that I, we've already produced on this, but uh, it is a sociological position being black in America, being born in this skin. It is, it is a state of being. It is an ontological a position. It, it, uh, in itself, it says every political thing that might be said, even though it might not be the same political position. And so I think that the more we actually are representative of the best or the most exemplary, whether or not we think it's good, whether or not we think it's right or wrong, agree with its uh, perspective, uh, put it to some sort of litmus test 
that is anything other than aesthetic. It is either a good example or, or at least a representative example of a form that is inherent to Black America. And I would say that Black America has contributed the only original art forms in the United States. Uh, interestingly, of course, that, that's not an original opinion. The only other competing thing would be a bunch of duck decoys that I think the Iroquois nation made. It's the only original Native American art form is, is work songs or the blues or jazz or what have you. The, the, that's the really the, and then actually, uh, interestingly, even in the performance of things like Shakespeare, at a certain time in the early part of the 19th century, Black Americans were the only indigenous Americans of note, even performing Shakespeare. So our, our, our legacy is, is long. It is uh, undeniable. It transcends any sort of political positioning. And, and I think in so doing in itself, it is a moral and philosophical position. But that's, that's what it is. It's to uh, be able to showcase, um, like the Lincoln Center, uh, uh, but, 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 you know, not even more, but it's to say it would be a kind of black version of the Lincoln Center, a home, a hub, a satellite, not even a satellite, a mothership that could have satellites uh, to those things that define the black American culture. So that, that's what it is. And, and I think that it, in its contributions in dance, rhetoric, uh, um, theater, film, television, uh, music. Okay. Why is it important now? Why do you feel like it's so important now? It's always been important. Um, and, and it's always, uh, it's just that nobody did anything about it. And I think that, you know, that um, it's not somebody else's obligation to think to do it. But now, because I think, uh, you know, now what, there's no time like the present. It's the fierce urgency of now. If we do not, if we do not acknowledge, chronicle, preserve, these contributions, they will be lost to history. And this has been in danger of happening. And to some extent, some of it is already lost and irrecoverable, but it is our ethical, uh, artistic, racial obligation that it be us and that it be right now. The sooner the better, because otherwise these things uh, will be lost uh, to history forever. And our just recognition for the contributions therein uh, will also be, you know, lost. What would you like to see in it? What would you like to see at AMPA? Well, I think the first uh, service that it could provide is to uh, is, is to present. That is, that um, that as a museum, it'd be a living museum. Uh, it might have been our toad or somebody, I can't remember. Somebody said that, you know, European museums are sort of a noted for putting dead things on the shelf and, and, and presenting them. Whereas uh, an actual museum, uh, to some extent, you know, uh, 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 black life in itself is a kind of museum that is uh, in, in, in real time. Uh, if you go to a church on Sunday, you can actually be looking at a, at a living museum. So I, I think that, um, that what I wanna see it, in it are exemplary evidences performances, ideations of what black culture can be defined as being. That is to say, um, a, a, the story, the, the, the narrative of a people, of, of, of a people in a foreign land who have been abandoned by the people who sent them to that land and by the people who were there to meet them when they arrived at that land and their coping mechanism for dealing with it in its most effective uh, um, demonstrative way has been our culture. And that culture can be seen, you know, as I say, on churches on Sunday, in the records from Stax or Motown, and the, and the African American, the, and the Negro spiritual, and, and the way that we move through space, uh, dance, and all of these things. It is in itself um, acts of defiance, of expression, of self actualization. Of, cre of pure creativity, that really to me, and, and I think that these are debatable points, what, what, what it is to be black, what it is to be black art, uh, but those, but this debate has been going on, you know, really for some time. I, I would take it back to, you know, for 
although it's really no one person's uh, original idea, but you know, the black arts movement as defined by Baraka and, um, and people like that. But of course it, it predates those things. But that's what I want to say. I want to see Muntu have a home uh, and, and and not just the home, that's the that's the Lily and Marcy aspect of it. Uh, but for them to have a space where people can observe them uh, and, and create uh, in their creative genius, that is a viable space, but uh, where we can remove um, any concerns about you know uh, long term viability and all of these things, but that they would be able to perform there for the for the demographic of people that uh that need it that created it that inspired it and that it would be preserved for history because i think that you know i think that um everybody is interested in it everybody's already ripping it off i just want to be able to show as as the, as the people say these days the receipts of, of why we are laying claim to our own and and uh i think it's vital i think it's vital uh spiritually as well, where the, where the right and wrong get into it, the theology, which does determine what is good or bad, or right or wrong, and, and, and the aesthetics, which determines what is or what is not persuasive, that there is an intersection there that they both have in common, which is the truth. These ideas such as, you know, the transcend race, time, uh, gender, all of the, there is this idea uh, of truth and beauty being synonymous. You know, going back to even to the classical Greek philosophers, or beauty is truth, and truth is beauty. But how can they have the truth unless the truth be given to them? The Bible, Romans ten and fourteen, or something says, uh, "How can they, you know, believe on something they have not heard, and how can they hear without a preacher?" And I think so. I think that, that what we're doing is that we are uh, uh, that that AMPA is really a church pulpit and that and that whoever you know that that whoever is in the pulpit at that time be it Muntu or congo square or uh, or uh, any number of other performance uh or institutions which have a long legacy but no home no one place no single place uh which can contain all of it this this hub a kind of pentagon of arts as it were um that that's what i want to see there you know, again, whether or not I think it's any good, there should be an opportunity for the Black, uh, the North Carolina Black Arts Fest, Theater Festival, so forth, that whatever wins that or whatever is deemed to be, you know, an example of those things, uh, the music throughout the, the uh, there are all these little orchestras and ensembles where little Black kids are trying to learn to play things, uh, both in a, in a whatever is called the classical tradition, jazz and all the but there's no place where there is this, this common ground where the coming generations uh, can actually have conversation, influence, tutelage, inspiration, uh, a kind of communication as it were, uh, with the people who were the masters of the form. And that in itself, it is self-generating, self-perpetuating and, uh, and all of that. So that's what I want to see. So, but, but I don't think uh, what I want to see out of AMPA need be the exact same ingredients but i but or, or at least have the same recipe but that it does perhaps uh, contain similar ingredients thank you gary i'm going to move on to pomon Ramey. he's been sitting here i'm looking at him i always love to hear um whenever we have conversations i'm always i always walk away um enriched uh i learn a lot just from simple conversations from so thank you for being here, Pomone. Okay. And, um, you know, we've been talking about AMPA and the idea of AMPA. And so with everything that you've heard about what it is that we're trying to do, you know, one, you know, what do you feel about it? What are your things about it? And then uh, the same question that I asked Harry, you know, why now is this important? Or like he was saying, you know, it's imperative. But more importantly, what would you like to see in it too? In, um, in 1960, between 1964 and 1981, there were over 22 black cultural institutions on the South Side alone that centered on our ability 
to be able to get together to have discourse about those things that would improve the quality of our lives. The Topographical Research Center, the uh, DuSable Museum, the Southside Community Arts Center, uh, uh, Transition East, the Afro Arts Theater, the Southside Center for the Performing Arts. I could go on and on and on. All of these institutions were functionally designed with the purpose of improving our lives. If we're going to move forward with the development of a new institution, it has to take into consideration those things that have existed and a fundamental question that I think a lot of times we don't want to ask, which is how does it restore us to our traditional greatness? And if we are structuring anything, if we are producing anything, whether it's art, whether it's music, and it's not designed in a way that will improve the quality of our lives as a people, we then have done a disservice to our creativity. When I worked with Marla in LA, the first question I asked her when we were doing the, the performing arts school there was, what was the difference between her and Lee Strasberg School? Because you would have more access to uh, casting people if, if I went to Strasburg than I would if I went to Marla's place. What we arrived at was that if it wasn't rooted in our history, and in our future, there was no difference. Because you fundamentally teach, you know, how to laugh, how to cry, how to scream, how to you know, get mad. Because emotion is an emotion is emotion. So I would challenge us to take a look at those things that exist already. And you mentioned uh, history makers. Because if we're going to create a living museum, that museum should should incorporate those things that currently exist and our ability to be able to get it to people in a way that they can improve the quality of what they're doing. Another example, there is no existing, and if I'm wrong, somebody can correct me, there is no existing place where every black play that has written exists that you can go to and just get it off the shelf. Yes, sir. Right? And so that, as, a, as something, could be part of what is there. Just the place where our stuff is. If you look at, if you look at the DuSable Museum, we don't own it. If you look at, at, at uh, Schomburg, we don't own it. If you look at the, uh, the museum in D.C., we don't own it as a people, which is why they could tell them that they had to put up something about Clarence Taylor when they were trying to celebrate um, uh, Thurgood Marshall because we don't own it. So we have to create this, this methodology of capturing our stuff and having a place for it to exist. Same thing's happening with video. I have the three only existing copies of Bird of the Iron Feather, which is the first black soap opera that was ever created. By PB it was called Bird of the Iron Feather. We did it at PBS in 1969, 13 episodes that we shot. And there are only three left because PBS erased all of them. And I was able to salvage three of them over the years. Mm. Outside of that, they don't, they don't exist. And I was in Trinidad, and they've collected all of these uh, the, uh, uh, videos from around the diaspora, but everything is rotting because they have no way of, of preserving it or transferring it to, to a digital form. So. Is, is that's, that's some of the things that I would like to see. But I would also like for there to be a strong curatorial group that, that looks at the philosophy that, that, that uh, Harry is trying to avoid. And I say that in the sense that what you, what you just structured for, for us is a way in which we can create a methodology without it being disrupted by our philosophy and vision which is impossible. So what you need is someone that is not in fear of succumbing to the pressures of the industry to create a paradigm that will allow us to be as truthful as possible while protecting our growth and the growth of our young people. 
finally, and I'll end with this. If our young people are not trained that they have a, a level of accountability to the continuation and the perpetuation of our culture, then what are we teaching them? If we bring them in through ETA or through Congo Square and then they go to New York and they become the biggest stars in the world and don't contribute that back, what have we done? What have we done to ourselves? What have we done to them? We should be teaching as part of, our, of the philosophy of this is that you got to give back. You have to make sure that these things are maintained. Finally, there needs to be a cultural repository of those people that have been before us that are no longer here. There, when I was at the DuSable Museum, for example, I ran into this brother who says to me, did you know my father worked here for 27 years? He was the director of education and history, and he taught everything from all the classes for 27 years, and there is no reference of him ever existing in that building that is criminal. It's criminal. And we can, look at, we can look across every institution and have that same criticism. And we should correct it. Anyway. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. I, I'm sitting over here. I feel like I'm in school. I'm like, wait a minute. What is so far? I, you know, I had to get my book out. Oh, uh, you know, but this is the reason and this is why this excites me. Um, well, I, I just want a real quick uh, addendum or rebuttal uh, to some extent for my brother, who I adore. But, and, and I love what you said. I just, I think that um, my only purpose in terms of, uh, you know, I'm not trying to in any way divorce, if I heard this correctly, uh, the black experience from its, uh, you know, from the kind of moral imperative of it in any way. I'm saying that in preserving, and I agree with you 100%, the whole purpose of it being a museum is that we can get everything that we might otherwise miss. So we go back in time if we go back, you know, all the way to, you know, people want to say 16, 19 or 15, whatever it is, whatever, and we talk about the diaspora, the, in itself, all of the politics and all of the kind of positioning from a racial perspective that needs to be done will be contained within the people that we, people, the ideas, the art itself that we are presenting. That's all, I, that's all, that's my, and I, but I think, I think the best thing is that we all, figure out what it is that it's supposed to be, but there's clearly enough here that we all agree on that uh, that needs to be preserved right away. Yeah, I'm not disagreeing, Harry, with anything that you're saying, but I just want to caution you about something. When, I, when we were at the museum, the president of the DuSable Museum becomes the face of activism, becomes the, the leader of the black community, becomes the face in the news, whether you want to or not. And so once this is established, that leadership becomes the voice. And, and when you fund it, uh, Mays Jackson, I don't know if you know Mays or not, but Mays just quit WBON here. And he, he left him and his whole crew to go to another station. And the reason that they did is because he was critical of the mayor. And the, and the, the ownership, uh, Melody, said, you can't criticize the mayor on our station because we're getting, you know, we're getting funded. So he had to leave. So that's, that's the other part of this that you face. It's like if you say the truth about our history, then you, you stand the possibility of backlash from funders. But you've got to recognize who that voice is because you've got to have somebody out there fighting for you. So, yeah. Women. No pressure, right? <laughs> no, it's no, no, no pressure. No pressure. Yeah. So, Kamadi, I see you over there. This is another one that I'm jumping at the bed. <laughs> no, Kamadi. Uh, I'm not really uh, chomping at the bit. I'm just um, recognizing that this is not a new position that we're in. This desire. Um, so, first, I want to say um, I am grateful that the charge is on again um, because so many of our institutions have attempted to collect this history to hold on to it and it's been a difficult battle a really difficult battle um, in a conversation I had with some black theater leaders I think it was a couple of years ago um, so many people have destroyed the information because they didn't own the building 
they they were evicted, had to move. Uh, St. Louis Black Repertory spoke about all the stuff he had to get rid of because it became so critical they had to move at the last minute and they were just dumping stuff. We just recently had to try to stop that at ETA. I'm no longer there, but we were able to intervene so that they actually warehouse the stuff rather than get, get rid of it. That's where so much of our stuff is. Um, I came here in 1968 from Memphis, and it was a wonderful time in my life. And by the 70s, I was fully incorporated into what was happening in Chicago. I went to the Topographical Center. I was a part of those kinds of things. Uh, and I started ETA in 1976, and that really expanded my experience in the arts uh, in Chicago. And it actually was what the turning point for me in making the decision to become an artist. Um, so what you're proposing to do brings me joy and I also feel the, the kind of pain and angst that Pei Moon is talking about, about what the challenge will be. And all I say to that is forward, ever, backward, never. We got to keep moving forward with, with this. We have to keep moving forward with this. Because it is our duty, it is the right of survival, uh, and it's going to bring us the peace and allow us to nurture the generations that are coming. We nurtured two or three generations behind us. We lost the generations after that because their education was out of our control. So they were not introduced to who we are as artists, as teachers, you know, as professionals. We lost those connections to a great degree, not all, but to a great degree. If we are to be whole again, if we are to be whole again, we have to take control of us. And that is in teaching our children their history and their culture. And culture is the key. It is the key. It is the key. So this museum has to be living, but also historical. We have to know the absolute foundation of our work once we hit this piece of land. From the very beginning, we need to know that first drum, that first heartbeat in this land. We need to trace it down. It has to be present in a living museum. And that first drum has to be replicated through all the work that we do. Dance, music, theater, whatever, painting, whatever. When I look at Carrie James Marshall's work, I laugh. I am full of joy. Because he paints us the blackest black, and it is the most joyous black you will ever see. I literally laugh every time I see something. Literally laugh. Because I recognize, I recognize the struggle of my grandmother and her mother coming up during those times. It's a piece of theater to, to look at that. It really, truly is. So to do this to Ron, I mean, it's gonna take muscle, but more than that, it's, it's gonna take heart and you can't be held, you can't be bound by the forces who do not want the truth present. And that's a lot of people. That's a lot of people. So. I, you know, I got both fists. I'm cheering, you know, uh, because it has to get done. So much of the work is already done. Pay Moon has said that so much of the work is here. We just have to claim it. We have to find out how do we claim it. And we have to make this an inheritance, because I think that's one thing we forgot to do with our children is to make it their inheritance. It's theirs. And if we make it their inheritance, we charge them with growing that inheritance for the next generation. That's something we have, we have to do. A lot of us do it in our individual families. You know, I'm sure Lana's teaching her kids, you know, this is how it is. You know, no back talk. And I think we have to approach them that way too. This is the inheritance, no back talk. Hmm. You know, put in, put something in, grow it, grow it. Because everything is not in D.C. Everything is not in D.C. in that museum. It's, uh, in, yeah, it's, it's not there. 
It's just not there. And I love that museum. I've gone through I, I, It's not there. But this is, Chicago's just a badass city. <laughs> just come on with it. It's just a badass city. <laughs> you know, and we just need to embrace that with this project. This is a badass project, you know, and it has years to grow. But you got to bring bring people along with it. it. I mean, you just might as well go ahead and be a badass and don't worry about it. Just do it. Well, you know, you just know, well, you know me. Yeah. I, I was telling Sholene, she was laughing at me. Um, I agree with you, mm -hmm. and um, and believe me, this gentleman on this little big mm -hmm. box right here, this Mr. Harry Blennox, and everybody in this room is a badass, and has exuded that. Not uh, as 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 he said in the um, uh, what was that Alice in Wonderland much muchness. Mm -hmm. We all have much muchness and mm -hmm. and are not afraid or fierce. So mm -hmm. I think I mean you know your your reputation precedes you in terms of fighting, and so I think we know that, and that's you know why we're here mm -hmm. uh, because it's worth fighting for. Yes, and I, the last thing I would say is um, it is important to build the most stable foundation possible. And that foundation has to be the work that's already gone on before us. It has to be contained in that foundation, so no one has to worry or wonder the root. No one has to worry or wonder about the root. It will be there, and that's a lot of work. That's a lot. That's a lot. We are scattered all over the world. The world, which is why this is so exciting, though. I mean, it's a lot. Believe me, I sit up and uh, I talk to people all the time, and. I'm always like, and I always find at some point in my conversation, I go, and this is a lot, mm -hmm. but it's, you know. But there are many hands many to do Many hands. It. There's there a lot of people. hands to do And there are, you know, advocates all over the world. Yes. So, Alana, I'm looking at you, my sister. Mr. Prince. Well, you know, the only thing I was going to add is that this is also an appropriate time not to use a contemporary model. Because if you look at museums, and this is around the world, they really have not been good for anybody. They have been based on lies, stolen material, and we can go on and on and on about what museums represent. As we look towards the development, I mean, it's just true. Oh, uh, right? no, no shade. I have no shade. As a, as a confirmation. That's oh, all okay, it cool. is. It's a uh, <laughs> so it, it's, it's about looking at a different model as well. That So if we could throw out the notion of of what a typical museum means to you, and with black folks especially, like because I've been to museums around the world where you, you see all this flat stuff on the wall and you have to go there and read, I think that you're going in a different direction. And I think that if you can stick on the course of using the creativity of the people that are around you to not only be there and preserved, but also to help to create what it is, so that when you walk in, you walk into an experience that is like no other. It's not your temporary big hall with a, you know, with a dinosaur in the hallway. It's something else. And it, it's, if this is not the time to do that and to create something else that is totally different, I don't know whenever it will be. That's all I was going to add. Alana, thank you. I can't so listen, if you don't know who Alana Aranis is, I want you to tell us a little bit about yourself, but I'm just going to tell you why I, how I know her. Uh, I was privileged to be on stage with Alana, and we were doing a play that I I know for me it changed my life, um, which was The Bluest Eye, Toni Morrison's The Bluest Eye. And we did it, yep, and we did it here, and we did it in New York. And um, when Alana told me about the project that she was working on, and what she was trying to do about preserving uh, the history of black theater in Chicago. Uh, I told her about this and immediately she was like, what you need, what you need? So talk to me, Alana, tell me, talk to me. What, what, you, what you gotta say, Alana? Okay, so um, first of all, hey Harry, how you doing? You took me out to lunch, you, you called me, you was like, let me talk to you, little girl. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, I appreciate you. Um, so basically, very honestly, um, it breaks my heart actually to realize how much we rely on common sense. And my good friend Terrell McCready is always telling me, Alana, common sense is not common. So I, so I say that to say that 
I think we have relied on common sense to to say that, oh, our children will pick this up. Our children will know that they're supposed to pay it for. Our children will know. Well, unfortunately, um, our children are being brought up as Americans, and Americans are terribly individualistic. Mm -hmm. And so we walk forward with ourselves in mind, and not necessarily the people who got us where we are going. And and, and, and unfortunately, Americans be, can be very deceptive about thinking that you got there by yourself. It's like, no, you, you, it's, it's some people who open some doors for you, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so I say all that to say that it actually wasn't until um, some years ago I was doing a reading that Ms. Cheryl uh, was directing, curated by Ron O.J. And it, Ms. Cheryl, Ernest Perry, Mr. Ernest Perry, and Ron O.J. were like, we were doing paperwork around the table and they were reminiscing and they were cracking up and I was sitting there and I was like, oh my God, these people have a whole history we don't know nothing about. It just dawned on me. They've been here and they know some stuff that if nobody asks them to write it down, record it or something like that, we're not going to know it. That's the first time it dawned on me. I've shared um, in the room before the call came on that through, so I've been working on a documentary about black theater in Chicago. And in the interviews, it's be, it just dawned on me like, wow, I went to a four year institution. I'm talking to other people who went to, who went to four year institutions in Chicago. And they were never taught about black history or any theater history that happened in Chicago. The only thing you know when you come out these institutions, you wanna work at Steppenwolf, you wanna work at this place, and you want, that's the honest to God truth. So I don't fault children, I don't fault our younger generations. I, I feel like in the same way that you will drill into your children how to, how to recite the ABCs, principles have to be taught. You have to be taught to look for your people, preserve your culture. Those are things that I feel like we have taken for granted and relied on common sense. Like, well, if you're a black person, you got con no. We don't. We don't have that. That we have to diligently teach that, and just chalk it up to we're not passing on information, as you said, if we're not passing on that. So another transformative moment that happened to me when I I became a step one ensemble member. So I was there, and I was working with this guy for the first time, and we were backstage, and he was having this moment where he was. Um, he was just basically saying like, you know, man, they, they need to be doing this, they need, in terms of doing black work, they need to be doing this, they need to be doing that, da 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 And I said, you know what? I used to say that too. Again, this is the schooling, this is the school of thought that I come from. I used to say that too. They need to be doing X, Y, and Z, but, but they doing what they wanna do. <laughs> like, we, we should be doing what we wanna do. Like, we, we, we shouldn't be dependent on them to tell our stories, to, to produce anything for us. They're doing what they want to do with their resources. So well, I'm saying all of this to say that I have had to come to this thinking in so many roundabout ways rather than it being a part of my, my genetic makeup, my, my, my in-house teaching, you know what I'm saying? Like I had to come about it roundabout and that's, that's the step we want to eliminate for our children. Mm. And that's what's so important about Okay, I hear you. Okay, okay um, <laughs> yes. So basically, I came through this roundabout journey of understanding like, oh, this is the step that we want to eliminate for our children, okay? We want them to be able to, go, to, to, to know who they are, know their history, know everything that has happened so that you know that legacy because Paymon did it, it's in you to do it. You know what I'm saying? And, you, and it's just you going to carry it forward. That type of thing we want to we wanna do. And so, in talking about the children, um, because uh, when we came to Ron, sort of kind of talked to us about, you know, sometimes encountering a disconnect between the younger generation and the older generation. And I really, truly think it's because you have so many people coming from institutions where the interest is not your culture. That's the honest to God truth. You, you, have, to come to, you have to come through an institution 
where the, the purpose is perpetuating your culture. And Mr. Paymon shared with us that sometimes that's not even happening in our own institutions. So you know you can't rely on somebody else to do it for you. You feel me? Right. So the, the disconnect makes sense. But where the, the coming together is so important, the fact that Teron talked about this being an app, that's major. Like, I am not your connection to young people by any means. I'm like really dinosaur. So the fact that this is going to be an app, to me, is already revolutionary. You're going to have to do your legal due diligence when it comes to intellectual property and all of that good stuff, because that stuff ain't no punk. Trust, it ain't no punk. But the fact that you're you're already in the language that, that, that young people are communicating in, that's major. You need, pe you need young people to keep you current. You need young people to keep you um, current as, as terms of like, there's a lot of things that are popping off even in theater with the younger generation that I'm confused by. So this comes back to me to the question of, I hate to say it, but how, how, how are you defining black? And is it just an indiscriminate, like they black, they did it, so they in. And if that's what it is, I, I can dig it, I can get it. Because I feel like there are so many different black experiences and we need the gamut. But I will tell you that there have been things that have been produced that are getting heralded that I don't, I, I don't I don't know what's going on. Things that have been produced at my own theater that that hit with the public. And I've seen people defend on social media. And for me, it did not at all speak to anything that, that I think is relevant or true to the black experience. But it was a black play for the purpose of a black cause. So that that's just something that I want to throw in the mix. I don't know how you deal with that. If it's because I, I started to think, you know, if you do like a museum of hip hop, right? You have to have gangster rap in there. You can't you can't discriminate. You have to you have to talk about you gonna have to talk about Luke. <laughs> you gonna have to talk about Luke telling people to shake their mind and G strings. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and provide some context for that. I think I don't know. I'm just bringing that out. I don't know. Um, um, young people equal innovation throughout the states. Mr. Paymon brought up something that is a major concern to me, major concern. Once again, if I came through a four-year institution and I'm just now finding out who Val Gray Ward is, I know don't nobody in Florida know who she is. That's a major concern for me. These people, I did an interview with somebody. He is currently um, the director of um, a music something, the t I can't remember the title, at Montu, and he said his mother has danced with Montu from the beginning. From the beginning, she has given her life to Montu. And, and you know, as you do these interviews, you sort of kind of get into inter, inter institutional grievances that, that I'm, I'm not interested in airing. But he said his mother has been there, and, and there's, you know, lack of recognition and things of that nature. This woman will have served this institution for in her entire lifetime, and nobody outside of this city will know her name because his grievance is the people inside the city don't know her name. Mm -hmm. So it is extremely important to me that what you do is you help me understand who are the people in every state that have laid these foundations. Who are the people who have given their their life to their local community theater, to their you know whatever art form it is. That, that even the, if it weren't for somebody sitting down and saying, I appreciate your service, I appreciate your gift, that if your app is, is an app, it would mean the world to me that if I'm coming through Kansas City and I'm an artist, I can check up on the history of the, or, or not even the history, but what's going on in Kansas City. And to understand the fabric, I, I think it's so important that you know, you guys start where you need to start, you in New York, you whatever that is. But it would mean the world to me to know that we eventually, maybe not in our lifetime, but we could cover all the states because there are people who are who have sown their lives into things and and there's no record of them. And which is some of the things that we've talked about. And I think I have one other thing. 
Okay, in terms of what would I want to see there, um, something that I, I said in the room before the Zoom call happened was um, I came across, in trying to do some research, I came across this um, publication and it was basically talking, it was like the, you know, the Time Magazine, the, the latest happening for what was going on in, in, in different Chicago arts communities, but specifically black communities. It was talking about x bag and I was like, what is this? I, I never even knew anything like that existed. And then um, uh, maybe models, right? Like if you don't, if you don't know, if you weren't here to see something at Chicago Theater Company, if you weren't here to see something at, at, at X Bag, if maybe we can, you know, the, the models are, the renderings are a big deal in our, in, in the theatrical film. To, so you can get an idea of what that space looked like, what it would have like been like to be in that space, you know? Maybe that's not a big deal to other people, but I'm just trying to throw out some ideas for you, and that's all I got. Well, that is a lot, and <laughs> believe me, I mean, this is, thank you all, you know, this is the first conversation of many that we are going to have. Um, and for me, um, I would just say that just my whole thing about this, like I'm emotional right now because I I need to hear all the things that I'm hearing. I need to hear the 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 you know how challenging it's going to be. I need to hear you know that we have to make sure that all of these things are so important. And like you said, it's like right now I just feel like. It's so big. It's like huge. It's like monumental, right? And I'm just sitting here like, okay, 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 okay. But it has fueled me in such a way to, you know, it's a lot of information, you know. But I think as long as we keep continuing to have these conversations and, and be honest with one another, because I think that's another thing. Like you were just hitting on the, the disparities and the discrepancies and the things that have happened. Those have happened all over the world, and those have happened in all the institutions. And because of it, we are even more divided. But in order for us to do this, we're going to have to hear everybody's story, whether we believe it in or agree with it. But everybody's going to have that, and so it's just a lot. So I, I just want y'all to say know that I'm going to take it all in consideration. I'm going to keep you all posted. I'm going to be calling. I know I'm going to be a bug. I'm going to tell you all right now. Um, because... Teron, uh, Teron, it sounds like you might be winding down, but I, I mean, before you go, I wanted to, to say a couple of things. I, I, I don't want to presume that you're winding down if you're in the middle of your thing, though. No, no, no. no. Like I'm, I'm, I'm okay. only taking a, in account time because oh. I Zoom is supposed to schedule to, to end, but if I need to add more time, Harry, I want I'll keep you here all day. You know that. Hey man, I'm gonna tell I'm gonna tell Zoom that this is the black man's hour when they sit with his sister. <laughs> Zoom go away. <laughs> no, no, go ahead. Just, yeah, just real quick, I, I I think everybody there said invaluable things, and it's really there's something in a, in a movie called Shadowlands where uh Anthony Hopkins character, C.S. Lewis says to a guy, the guy says to him, we read to know that we're not alone. And so these kinds of meetings help us to know that we're not insane, that we are right. And I don't think it's a coincidence that all of us have, uh, you know, have the Chicago experience uh, in common and, and the kind of do for self attitude that I think is being expressed here, that it is we who must present this. But I just wanted to say there's something uh, and, and I think that maybe in one sort of false swoop, uh, I could re reply to a couple of comments. Pamela was talking about a curatorship, and I think that that's so key. I just wanted to put out there, I think that the very development of this idea uh, is going to be not just a burden, but I think a great joy to do the, to do the research, to find curators who have an assignment. Of the, like if it was Alana's, you know, uh, dream to sort of lead the research and to find all of the pieces that fit together, some of which already e exist, the commodities there, the ETA and so forth, and what Paymon knows and the CT, Chicago Theater Company actually sort of coming out of the vestiges of, of X-Bag, all of which is true, the people like Robert Townsend and 
all of these people, we have all of these connecting uh, tissue that if we, that we do have the time to put it together, but time is fleeting. But I think that the research of this, Alana, is, go is gonna be a great deal of fun. And I think Kamadi, to, to a certain extent of what you're talking about in terms of, uh, uh, and, and Pomona as well, that in itself, that the design, the design of the museum and our bylaws and our marching orders can themselves address everything. That is the perpetuity and the, the one generation teaching the other generation and the people who, who have any kind of connection to the museum uh, will have access, depending on whatever it is they just do with that access to the information, uh, to know whatever they want to know. And that if it is an app, then in its construct, when it is an app, that in its construction, we can be the black cultural uh, Wikipedia or Google or whatever. You want to know anything about any black performer, you should have access. But all of that stuff, you know, there is uh, all kinds of precedent for it. And we can actually really be on the cutting edge of, of, uh, of building into the design its own perpetuity, its own, its own uh, sort of, there's that idea of, uh, of the engine, the self-perpetuating engine perpetual motion, I think it's called. And I think we can design that into the museum itself, that you have, that it is an educational tool, a tool of inspiration and all, and all of those things. There's a, a beautiful, again, I'm going back to the, to the Greeks who learned from, from Africans, I'm sure, by the way, but this idea of entelechy, uh, the, the, the idea of telos, uh, teleological function, all this stuff in Greek was the aim, the intention of the thing. And Aristotle came up with this fantastic idea called entelechy. That is that the, the design or the intentionality or the ambition of the construction itself is, is self-contained. Um, Darwin talked about it as, as uh, irreducible complexity, that you cannot separate the idea of perpetuating, chronicling, preserving. Uh, with, uh, it, you cannot disallow that in the construction of the museum itself whether that's in the bricks and mortar of it or in the digital existence of it. But I think those two things could be seamless. And I think that, that, um, that we have at our access people like Juliana Richardson, who has been doing the kind of stuff with the history makers that we're talking about. So I, I think everything everybody is saying is, is right. And if, and, if we're, and if I'm correct about my assessment that we're not alone here, uh, somebody said the thing about the many hands, that it's a big job, it's a big lift. But I think that the way that we can pitch it is, is really to get all hands on deck and to really have a good time. Somehow, you know, it's the, the, the great bene benefaction of our culture <laughs> is that it proves that we can make a way out of no way, that even in the grips of despair and, and abuse and all these things, that Black people will have a really good time. And that we and that we can celebrate life in a way that no other group of people, perhaps because of of, of what we go through, and that that expression is in our culture. And that, Alana, that we can everything that you're talking about in terms of what people are celebrating and defending. Recently, maybe you've heard uh, Vi Viola Davis is now you know apologizing for playing the part in the help, which you know is a good start, but she shouldn't stop there. <laughs> There's a lot of people who have gotten awards, but she didn't say that at the time. And so if something is inconsistent, she accepted the award in the paycheck, for example. But if something is inconsistent with the description and the definition and the, and the, and the motive and the motto or, or whatever, the purpose of our company, of this, of this museum, then we don't allow it. But we can build that into the, into the bylaws. That if it somehow flies in the face of, of something that we can determine, is in its best interest or in the best interest of black people as a whole, that those are things that we can make uh, room for or allowances for, even though there will even be debate uh, there. But this idea, you know, everything that, that, that has said here, that was said here, I, you know, I think that we can figure out a solution for. You know, Harry, I just want to add two things. Both of us participated in the book by um, Marx Larson Ensemble. And, and when, Mark, when Mark came to me about the book, and he was talking about it, and I, I read a section of it, he talked about 1953 and the development of the theater at the University of Chicago, 
as the beginning of the Chicago theater movement. So I said to him, then how do you reconcile Langston starting the company in 1930? How do you, how do, you do that and talk about the development of theater? So what I would like to see ultimately come out of this, and I know a lot of you are August Wilson fans, but as a master, this institution should define our masters. We have to take control of that. And we have to say, these are our writers that, that we sanction. These are the artists that we sanction. And stop letting other people do it. So that if this museum, if this institution can define our stars and what that represents, we would have taken back control of a lot of what people are assuming that we should follow because they put it out in front of us. <laughs> thank you all for being here. Harry, thank you so much for being here. I will, you know, be in touch. And um, the only thing that I'm going to do now is um, tell you we can, we're going to wrap it up, but I will be in touch with every last one of you to continue this um, because, like Harry just said, it's going to be all hands on deck. And I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to need the help, and I welcome it. But like Harry said, we're going to have a good time. <laughs> We're going to have a good time, ain't right? we here? And at the end of the day, that's most important. We're going to have a good time. So we'll go to the party. It's going to be a long party. Everybody bring your boots and shoes. <laughs> and your pillows. <laughs> All right, Harry, I'll be in touch. Good seeing you, bro. Bye, Harry. Bye, Harry. Bye-bye. <laughs>